And what's going on guys, Pete here for another podcast. Hello my loyal listeners and welcome back. This is episode number two of the new series Ask the Coach in which we provide a bit of light relief from the heavy theoretical slog through the Grinders Manual and do a bit of questions. So I've got my friend and student James here with me today. How's it going man? Hi Paul. And we're going to be doing some more questions. Um, what have you got for me today James? Is it Should I be worried? Um... Yeah, there's a lot of lists. I know you love lists. So lists, yeah. Lists, so. definitely. So I just got up actually. It's like kind of like afternoon, but I don't know if I'll be able to like hold more than two things in my head at one time. But I'll do my best. We'll see how we get on. Yeah. So we were we haven't really done any lessons for a while, but last time I spoke to you, you were like taking a little break from poker, right? Like moving house and stuff. So are you getting back into the game now? Yeah, start new year. Um, everything's sorted with the house and stuff now, so I've got a lot more time to put into it. Um, I'm working nights at work now, so I can just grind all night at work, which is ideal. Oh, you've got one of those jobs where you can just grind at work. I envy people like that. I mean, I, I kind of do that myself, but I don't get paid extra money to grind, you know? I just get the money I make from grinding, so I guess you kind of get both best of yeah. both worlds there. Um, any New Year poker resolutions? Um, not really. Uh, I'd like to, at the end of the year, have moved up a stake, um, mm-hmm. but nothing really. Just mainly trying to learn because I'm fairly new to poker, so... yeah. Better to set no ridiculous goals than to set goals like be no, a I'll listen to that one. Until next week. <laughs> that one up. Yeah, that happens. You get people who set ridiculous goals, so it's good not to do that. They might, kill, they might have killed your enthusiasm. Okay, good. So, why don't we get into the questions then? Hit me up with your first one. Cool. So, your first one then is what are your top three tips to beating the macro stakes? Um, okay, number one, don't listen to anyone who says ridiculous stuff like it's the micros, never raise. Never three bet bluff. Never do anything fun because that's just simply not true. Um, at the micros, like yes, you do want to do a bit of straightforward stuff. Like when you're a new player, you don't want to learn like really advanced theoretical stuff. You don't need to care so much about like balancing your ranges and things. But you do want to learn like what's most plus EV in lots of situations. So if there's a net who's folding all the time to three bets, you should three bet him with a polarized bluff heavy range. If there's a player who folds too much by the river, you should triple him. You know you should try and get acquainted early with just like EV and not lock yourself into some ABC kind of net mode game because it's the micros and in your head it's still 2006 or whatever. It doesn't really work anymore in the tougher games. Like sure, there are some games in America where you can play like that and you can crush, but if you want to learn how to be good at poker, start to learn like why people do bluff in certain spots, like why people do things that aren't just value bet. Do get good at value betting, but do other stuff too. That'd be my first tip. Um, don't lock yourself into net mode. Um, number two would be like when you're a new player at the micros you're probably not going to have a positive win rate for a while like when you first started poker even if you've just hired a coach like it's going to take a little while for you to get a positive expectation if you're new to the game um, like you are James so yeah. what I would say is um, definitely don't base your goals on results like don't be like too keen to succeed right away don't get disheartened if you have a downswing and like all your progress is undone there's so many people like they're playing like Five no limit, they're learning the game and understand they want to succeed really fast, but I'll be like, how's it going? And they'll say, oh, terrible, I lost six buy-ins this week. And that doesn't mean it's going terrible at all, because if they've improved their game and they've learned a lot and they've improved their EV that week, then that's a huge success, but people's goals are too too impatiently based on short-term results, so I definitely recommend shifting them to a long-term focus where you improve your yeah. game. That's what's going to carry you through the stakes in the future. I that one. Yeah. Um, a third tip would be Get yourself very familiar with the variance of the game. Like, watch some videos on variance, do some variance calculations, get a realistic idea of what to expect so that you're not, so your mental game can actually have time to grow. Because otherwise, like, you're just going to get stuck in the sort of loop of, am I doing well? I don't know. You don't understand what's variance and what's not. Um, and you underestimate it. Most new players will underestimate variance and that will set them off. It'll hurt their mental game. It'll make them tilt more. It'll give them an unrealistic expectation of their win rate and things like that. So I definitely, those would be my my three um, top tips for succeeding in the micros. Don't be a net. Um, don't fall victim to results-orientated goals and short-term focus work on your game and also get yourself a good grasp of variance from the beginning. Cool. Well, um, so how do you know when to move up stake and what are the right and wrong reasons to do so? Good question. Um, you should generally move up stakes when you've got a very decent um, comfort level at the stake you were playing before, both results-wise and just skill-wise. 
so you feel like you can handle it, you're not currently out your depth or running into players who are frequently better than you and exploiting you in the long run. Um, you want to feel like you're comfortable, but also that you've got a, a win rate, so you want to have played. I mean, there's no hard and fast rule for this. Like, if you've won over, like, 10,000 hands and you've got the bankroll for the next day, maybe you should move up, maybe you shouldn't. That 10k can quite easily be variance and quite easily just be luck, or it could be a result of, like, good play as well. Um, it's hard to say. Probably you've won, you've ran fairly well if you've won a decent amount of money over 10,000 hands, regardless of your win rate. Um, but you should move up there if you feel like your skill level, like you're just co constantly seeing what the regs are doing wrong. You want to be ahead of the regs in your game. You want to be seeing the mistakes that they're making, the imbalances that you can exploit, not the other way around where you're the one just clueless all the time, um, feeling like a rabbit in the in the headlights. So good reasons to move up are just logically feeling very comfortable with the game, like you've got an advantage over other players and you've got a win rate, preferably to back it up, and you've got the bankroll for it, probably looking at about aggressive these days is about 30 buy-ins for the limit 6 max, depends on the game you're playing and how big your edge is, if it's zoom it needs to be a bigger bankroll of 50 to 60 minimum I would say. Um, I don't know why zoom a bit different. Well zoom is a game in which you're going to have much more volatile swings because you're not going to be table selecting and you're going oh, to be yeah. and you're going to be informationless a lot more often as well so your win rate in zoom will be lower, your BB per 100 but your hourly could be higher because of the amount of volume that you're playing and that's why people elect to play Zoom, they like it better, it's faster, it can give them a higher hourly even if the BB per 100 is lower. But with that comes a much lower win rate, comes a lot more variance and swings of 20, 30 buy-ins more commonly than you would get table selecting in really soft games. So um, bad reasons to move up would be I want to get my money back from the stake where I just went broke. Um, would be something like I feel like I can't make money at this stake because it's full of idiots who don't take the game seriously and I'm not going to play against idiots that's not true poker that's just such an idiotic thing to say in itself like honestly like if you feel that you can't beat 10 NL because you don't take it seriously there are probably insane holes in your mental game to the extent that if you move up there will just be other holes that will get you crushed at the next stake even if you do have the technical competency to beat it um Another reason, bad reason, to move up might be to take a shot. I thought I would just take a shot. That's not even a reason, but people say that. If I lost six buy-ins, I was going to move down again. Yeah, but you only had 15 for the stake. You just decimated your bankroll doing that. So don't be too aggressive, basically, as well. Cool. Um, next one, though. Yep. What things do you do outside of poker that you feel help your poker game? I know a lot, a lot of people play like Magic the Gathering and stuff. I do play Magic the Gathering, actually. Um, so playing Magic the Gathering is a highly in-depth thinking game. It de definitely helps logic, like for the two. Like each game helps your logic in the other. Um, there's a lot of strategic complex decisions you have to make, a lot of really complicated spots you need to think through in a lot of time. Um, I also play chess, which is definitely just logical thinking, problem solving, assessing, analyzing situations. I play bridge, just like an ultimate game geek, basically. Like you name it, I play it. Um, I love bridge. It's my favorite game. Like I hate to say this to like every, everyone that thinks I'm like a mainly a poker guy. Like poker is my profession. That's what I'm best at. But if I could just play bridge all day instead, I would in a heartbeat. I think it's such a better game. I think it's an amazing game. Um, so if you're one of these guys that won that Powerball thing the other day, you just quit poker and that'd be it. Bridge yeah, up there. absolutely. I would just like live in a huge mansion in the Bahamas or something with a big bridge house set up and they'd run tournaments all the time. And yeah, <laughs> honestly, uh, bridge helps a lot as well. Like all these other games, like if you have time in your life for a bit of diversity, I think it really helps with poker because A, you've got something to escape to if you're running bad. You can play another game that's really fun um, and is logical and keeps your brain alive in that way. But it's also not, money orientated it's not like going to tell the hell out of you um and also it's just nice i think to to get a different perspective on logic and practice logic in different ways i did philosophy as my degree which also helped massively with poker because it's just about assessing things for yourself on a logical basis that's all it is and that's what poker is too so lots of stuff you can do lots of stuff i do sweet um do you have any poker superstitions or rituals such as like a favorite hand a pre-session startup kind of thing mm. I never play poker when I've just come out of the bath but I think that's more empirical than it is like superstitious right. I just play badly I think it's like your body temperature is raised and you can't think clearly or make good decisions like try it next time you have a bath like try and fire up a session and see how badly you play um, maybe it's just me <laughs> maybe it is superstitious I, I like to think not um, favourite hand is like jack nine of clubs I don't really play it maybe subconsciously I would make like 
point zero zero one of a negative decision to play the hand where I wouldn't with like giant nine of hearts, but it would be a very tiny microscopic swing in EV. Like I would never do anything like clearly minus EV just for the sake of, or clearly worse, just for the sake of any superstition or anything. It's just ridiculous. Like it, there's a very common question and answer in poker when people say, what's your favorite hand? And most poker players say pocket aces because it's a great hand. It's the best hand. Um, so I agree with them. Like I like giant nine of clubs, but it would never alter the way I would play or anything You like never that. just lose your mind with it. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've met students before who have had weird things like that where every time they have like a certain hand, they have to try and win the pot. I used to play a variant of poker called Seven Deuce Ball where every time you get Seven Deuce um, offsuit, if you win a hand with it, you get paid out a certain amount of big blinds from every player. Right. And um, <laughs> some people seem to think that they want to play Seven Deuce Ball even when it's just regular no limit hold'em. Don't do it. I'll see, I, I know poker stars have to do these little like... Um cash quest kind of things mm -hmm. and that was one of them and the amount of people at my stakes that you'd turn over some of those it was oh it's brilliant crazy. I love that because people like they took it way too far I think you earned like a few BBs if you pulled it off and people would like bluff off entire stacks in terrible situations and be making like minus 38 BB decisions and stuff like that for the sake of it it was, it was great yeah um is there a different approach to playing live as opposed to playing online? Oh, yeah. And the ability of the stakes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the games play incredibly differently. Like, when I first went over to Vegas, my first Vegas trip, and played for, like, seven weeks out there, um, for the first week, like, I was playing, like, way too similar to how I'd play online six max cash. Um, I was isolating all the time with hands. I was going, like, five way to the flop, six way to the flop, with no fold equity. I should just be limping along. So live, we want to do a lot more limping pre-flop. Um, you want to do even I'd say live as well you can actually bluff fish a lot more than you can online that's another thing like not all fish there are some that never fold but there are types of fish live who you can just tell are really weak and you can bluff them or like old guys who you can tell are like you know like very likely to be nitty it sounds like ageist but it's not it's just a true reflection of the demographic and the way they think about poker based on the, the times um, so there's a lot of different stuff but the main one is fold equity pre-flop um, you just don't have any pots are expected to go multi-way there's almost a kind of tacit agreement like a communal um, belief that I can limp here because it's okay that because at one two no limit everyone else will limp too and if someone dares raise well I'll just call him and negate his isolation tactic so because of that your iso raises and your opens especially from early position need to be much larger and you need to do a lot more to ensure that you thin the field which is a, a primary reason to raise before the flop in any form of poker is to make sure that you know a you have more fold equity with c betting because most hands miss most flops and no limit and b you can actually set up a pot for value and have a field small enough that your top pair over pair will actually be able to hold up often as a value hand and win you a bunch of money so those are the main differences cool. um what would your ideal six max table consist of in terms of people um just five horrendous fish um one would be like a 98 four whale who just like called every hand pre-flop and folded unless he flopped a set on the flop or something like that another would be like a raving maniac who just threw in like 100 bbs all the time on the flop with complete air and i could just bluff catch middle pair um, so would you have no celebrities or historical people or anything like that oh right i see like i was thinking this from an ev point of view <laughs> this is like a very very easy question that's <laughs> so like you can tell like the mind of the poker player right it's just like give me five fish like, okay, let's take five famous people who don't know how to play poker, then that would be fine. Like, I'm, <laughs> so good for the money. Yeah, I'm sure, like, the average celebrity or whatever is pretty horrible. Not actors, because some of those actually play, but, like, I don't know, let's take some sports people. They're generally pretty awful at poker, right? Um, play. I imagine Wayne Rooney's pretty bad. Who is? Wayne Rooney. Wayne Rooney. I would, imagine, <laughs> I would imagine that he's, like, one of the worst poker players ever. Like, I think I'd just tag him as a whale if I... If he sat down at my table... I wouldn't even need to see him play a hand. I've just seen interviews with a guy attacking him as a whale right away. No offence, Wayne, if you're watching the Carrot Poker podcast, but I suspect you've got other things to do with your time. So I don't know. I mean, like, if I had to pick, like, a famous person that... I don't know. I'm not really one of these people that, like, loves, like, actors or singers or whatever. Um, there's really... I don't know. There's really no one out there that I really, like, look up to in that sense. Like, I like a lot of philosophers... But they'd probably be too good at poker, so I don't know if I'd want them <laughs> at my table. But yeah, I don't I don't have like a list of like celebrities that I'd be like dying to go to dinner with or anything like that. I don't really care for that shit to be honest. I don't even watch television, honestly. Like um I tend to like live more just in the, the sphere of the things I'm interested in and not yeah. care so much about popular culture. So I don't really have a good answer for that that people would be interested in. Um what is your favourite poker moment 
like a big win or stuck out against a particular villain? Wow. Um, I think my favourite poker moment was a tournament I played when I was horrible at poker. I was like 19 years old and I'd really just learned to play the game seriously. Like I'd go to like the crappy university poker club tournament in Edinburgh and I would like sit down and I'd be like really nervous and like my heart would be racing because it's like the first proper game of poker I ever played that wasn't a home game or whatnot. And I, I used to fancy myself as like a poker prodigy back in the day. I used to think like I'm going to be amazing one day. I'm going to be like great at this game or whatnot. And I even thought I was at the time, which I wasn't. I was, I was awful. Um... And there was one hand that came up where I had pocket sixes and I had raised before the flop and villain who was probably the best player at the club who he kind of just like struck fear into players because you looked at him and he was just so logical and he had glasses and he just looked really smart and geeky and like no one wanted to play a pot with him because it was like he was like not only smart and geeky but also like he could like read your soul as well this guy he was like the Phil Ivy yeah. of the club but like far less cool than Phil Ivy um, and we got into a hand where he flatted out the big blind when I had sixes and we went to the flop and the flop was like it was like king like nine three or something like that and I like nervously like continuation bet the flop and he raised and I had pocket sixes so I'm like king nine three and I thought for a while and I looked at him and I was like I bet he has nothing I bet he has nothing he's obviously got nothing and like it was based on nothing it was like complete fish logic I'm yeah. sure but I convinced myself that I had soul read him for having air and I shipped the rest in and he had to call off like a tiny amount that was left behind with pocket forts. So he was drawing to two outs and he said, oh, I'm drawing thin, really great call. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm amazing. I'm such a pro. And I felt like amazing at the time. And I like my friend Bobby came up to me afterwards and he was like, man, that call was incredible. I was like, yeah, well, you know, yeah, I'm just great, obviously. And now I look back on it and I was like, was that call based on anything other than a thought like, I think he's bluffing? And my students have these thoughts today. Like, why did you call that river? I thought he was bluffing. Why? Because the bet size looked like a bluff. Why? I don't know. You know, and the, the logic breaks down really quickly because it's not yeah. based on anything. It's based, the, the fallacy here is that people think that they should be able to know a lot more about the game than they do or they should be able to like psychically soul read people. Like you see poker on the TV and like Phil Ivey's looking into someone's soul and makes like a huge call and people think that's what it's all about. That if they're going to be a good player, they need to be almost psychic and they invent reasons as to why they knew things they didn't know. So the lesson there is don't be an idiot and don't let results reinforce bad play, basically. Because it was a horrible call. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's the strangest thing that's ever happened to you at Pop Um, Probably when I was playing live, and there was a dude who... I think I was at a different table, actually. I don't know if this counts, but I could see it from the table opposite. Um, where I was... Like, I, was, I wasn't playing a hand or whatever, so I was just, like, looking at the other table. And there's one player who... They were on the river, and they were, like, like, I don't know, like, very deep, probably, like, 600 BBs deep or something like that, 500 deep. Um, big stacks, like, $1,200 or whatever at one, two. And comes down on the river, and a guy goes to bet, like, he goes to make a bet of, like, 70 bucks into a pot of 100 or something. And it's a three-flush board. And his opponent, before the chips hit the felt, his opponent goes, call. And then the player who is betting says to the dealer, is he bound to call any sides? And the dealer says, I don't know. Um, I guess the tournament director over, who says, yes, he has to call any size of bet. I don't know if this is even the right rule or not. I'm not really sure. But then the guy goes, I'm all in. <laughs> and the guy is like... I see where that was going. Yeah, he's got flush. He's got like, the not flush. And the guy's the other players are like, completely furious about it. He's been held to call off $1,200, and he starts like shouting about how he's going to shoot up the whole casino, and he has to get like escorted out and dragged away by security and stuff. And I felt kind of bad for the guy, to be honest. Like, it's a pretty horrible thing to happen. Um, but it just shows how careful you have to be sometimes at the live table. You don't have a button that you can... It's not going to tell you when it's your turn to act, so... Yeah. Last one, then. Mm -hmm. what, do you think, what do you think makes the Carrot Corner community such a great place to learn? That's an awesome question. It allows me to, like, promote Carrot Corner community. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably... I like it if that was chosen for that reason. Um, anyway, Carrot Corner is the student group where when someone hires me as a coach, they instantly are provided with, as long as they buy a package of five sessions or more, they're provided with access to this free learning community from that point onwards, where they'll they'll be a member for life, basically. Uh, it's not the kind of thing you pay a subscription for. It's not the kind of thing you need to continue buying coaching for if you don't want to, although I like to think most people would like to continue. Um, but in the community, there are currently like 57 members, and we basically talk about 
hand histories, people send in videos, people ask theoretical questions, people ask for help with range construction, ISEC quizzes, that kind of thing. Um, what makes it a great place to learn poker, in my opinion, is that I've got like four moderators who are pretty solid and the ethos of the corner is that we don't berate anyone, we don't like give anyone a hard time, we don't make anyone feel stupid, we encourage learning actively, we don't spoon feed either. So those are the two main things. We don't, we'll never spoon feed your information. We'll usually ask you to you know, come up with an idea on your own about if you post a hand history with no thoughts, the mods will come back and the more experienced posters will come back and say, well, you need to tell us what you think and work on your own thought process. Similarly, if there's ever any kind of dispute on there, it's usually good natured and it's not, it doesn't stem from any animosity. It's just people being competitive about their reasoning. And I like to think we're quite good at staying respectful at all times and making yeah, sure. So I've never seen anything bad on that. No, I mean, we don't, it says at the top of the page, like, we don't tolerate, like, horrible, egotistical, abusive behaviour just so people can be internet warriors and feel better about themselves. That's not what it's all about. That's what most poker forums, unfortunately, they do have an aspect of that, a lot of them, but we just eliminate that completely and we're very, like, student-centred. We try and, like, make the student um, the centre of attention in his hand, make him the one who has to do the work if he goes wrong. Fine, we'll tell him where he went wrong, but we won't ever just spoon feed him information and be like, you need to fold here. Like, I've seen some poker forums, and it's a bit different because the people on there are not as tight a community, but a poster will come on who's got like a billion posts and is really respected, and he'll say, fold. And I'll be like, the end of the thread. And it's like, really? You don't want to like talk about why you don't want the poster to say why he didn't want to fold and why that's bad. You just wanted to give him a one word answer. So, yeah, we're very thorough, we're very welcoming, we're very encouraging, and we're very student centered. So, I'd say those are the the reasons why it's definitely a good perk of getting of hiring me for coaching is getting into that community and i hope that you know in the future as it continues to grow we can branch out and who knows where the corner is going to go it could become a training site of its own um there's a lot of potential for it it's a good base of players we've got on there now so definitely recommend um that if you're on the fence about hiring um, me as a coach then that might be a factor that could sway you it's a very good place to learn the way I thought about it is it, that place is almost worth the money alone. So the caution they get from yourself is, mm -hmm. by the by, yeah, I've so probably learned as much from that as I have from the lessons that I've had with you. And that's the whole point because in between coaching, you shouldn't be left on your own. Like You shouldn't be hiring a coach for an hour and then just being like left with homework and no one else to talk to. You need community in between. Obviously, like I've got lots of students. I can't just like be on hand privately for everybody, but I can give public feedback and I can get my moderators and and more experienced posters to give public feedback. So that's the whole point. It's like sort of delegating my knowledge down through my more experienced students to my less experienced students. And it's like a pyramid thing that works really nicely because if there's ever a dispute or whatever, you know, I can come on and give my thoughts as the coach. Not that I'm always right or anything, but the, the idea is to higher up the pyramid you go towards the coach at the top, like the more um, accurate the information is likely to be. It's not always going to be completely correct or anything, but... That's the whole point. Like sometimes there'll be a thread where the hand is dealt with so well by my mods or by anyone on the forum really could give a really good answer that I just don't even need to post it, and that's that problem solved. And they feel like they've got that support, and like they've got friends and like stuff as well. Like it's very important to have community in poker. It was one of the things that helped me the most when I was starting out in the game. So yeah, cool. That's it. That's all my questions. All right, awesome, James. Well, thanks for coming on the the show, and we will get you on again in the future. I'm sure to see how you're doing. Cool. And thanks for having me. Cool. Best of luck in your poker journey. For the rest of you guys, I'll be back next week. Um, we'll be doing a special episode next week with another friend and student of mine called Zach, who's actually actually started his own poker podcast um, about live poker and just an analyzing live spots with his friends so i'm gonna do a bit of promotion for him and like and vice versa so i'm gonna get him on the show to talk about that for you guys it's quite an exciting um new podcast for anyone interested in live poker and after that we'll get back to this ask the coach and also to the grounders manual so plenty more stuff to expect from me update on the book quickly um it's not far off now i've sent all my chapters off for editing for different people and I'm waiting on getting some of those back and I'm just going through them and it should be done in a few weeks, hopefully. And yeah, exciting time. So that'll be available on Amazon as an ebook. So see you guys on the next podcast. Thank you for listening as always and good luck at the tables. Um.